Excellent. That's our identity. We are no more without it. <laughs> a, na- a nation is all about culture. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. And there, that's the glue that binds the society. Right? So we're live. We're go- we've gone okay, live. Good. We want to uh, say good morning or good afternoon or uh, good evening, wherever you happen to be. I'll try and look in the camera here. My, I'm, my name is John Cook. I'm in, sitting in Zurich in Switzerland with uh, Chairman of Rock Lake Associates. Uh, and uh, I'm here to lead this panel discussion today at Harassus on, um, on culture from Indian culture and its impact and uh, DNA to drive, uh, help drive uh, both India and uh, the world into a new future and what impact uh, culture ha- Indian culture has on that momentum. I'd like to welcome the five uh, expert panelists we have on the call today. Um, the first one I'd like to introduce uh, with us is uh, Bahavna Qatar, who's editor and publisher of Take on Art magazine. She's based in Delhi. And uh, uh, Bahavna, welcome. Could you give a uh, sort of one minute background on yourself, one or two minutes? Hi, I'm welcome. Bhavna Sakkar. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this esteemed panel. Uh, it is my first time in um, uh, in a Horace session. I'm based in Delhi. I have a gallery called Latitude 28 and a magazine called Take On Art. Uh, I have been in the business of art for about 20 years now. And my magazine uh, Take is 10 years old uh, and also my gallery, which promotes and uh, exhibits contemporary art from South Asia and India. The magazine itself is one of the very few from India, which is kind kind of got a global wanted point. It 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 is present in all the international art fairs, biennales, and uh, ten years back when I launched it, there was president of art magazines, but not so many that gave access to new young voices. So that has always been my mandate to kind of, you know, when I passed out from art school, I'm from fine arts as well. Uh, not so much place was there for promoting the young artists that we have or nor we lack art institutions in our country, as we all know. But uh, there are a lot of private spaces, but they always kind of bank upon more uh, renowned names and bigger, uh, you know, uh, big ticket um, items as they call it in art so so for me it was very important that uh, the younger voices are given a chance that's what i do very interesting very you're you're a leader in your space i am i don't know maybe (laughs) Uh, next i'd like to invite uh lieutenant general sudhir sharma uh chairman of mikat advisory services who's sitting in delhi welcome sudhir we've done this before together it's great to see you again you have a long history of running large organizations with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of soldiers and, and business people. Could you give your own background, please, and uh, share, share your current experience? Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, my name, like you said, is Lieutenant General Sudhir Sharma. I'm a retired three-star general of the Indian Army, served for 40 years in the Indian Army. You said thousands, uh, John, to correct you, million, actually. Million strong army, so we're talking about a large body of troops. Uh, I retired about 10 years back and been assisted with the horses ever since then. But I became an entrepreneur after that, and now I'm running a company known as Bitcat Advisory, which is into risk mitigation at the global level. And I'm the chairman of the company, so happy to be part of Horaces, happy to be part of this very lovely subject cultural diversity and cultural history of India and modernity. And I would love to. Give my views on that when the time comes. But happy to be part of Horaces. Happy to be part of you for a long time. Thank you. It's great to see you again. You, I always learn from you every time we're on a we're on a session together. And I hope we meet again in person pretty soon because we yes, look forward to that. In person, It'll be a long time, long time. Look forward to that. Next, uh, please, I'd like to invite. Um, I'm going to take a shot at this. Um, Brahmashanda, Brahm, Brahmish. Anand Just start with Swamiji. Swamiji is perfect. Swamiji. Don't even try it. I've tried it. My, it's too much. It's too much. <laughs> it's too uh, much. Swamiji or Swami, uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, you're joining us today from Goa. And I know that you're a spiritual leader with lots of uh, ideas and momentum for the, for the Indian culture. Could you please share your background, what you're doing today? 
नमस्ते एवरी वन आई एम स्वामी ब्रह्मेशानंदाचार्य स्वामी जी आई एम बेस्ड इन गोवा इंडिया एंड वी आर प्रोमोटिंग आवर ओन कल्चर बाय आवर ओन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन वी हैव आवर ओन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इंटरनेशनल सदगुरु फाउंडेशन एज वेल एज श्री दत्त पद्मनाभ पीठ इट इज सिक्स हंड्रेड इयर्स ओल्ड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन वी आर रनिंग and we run guru shishya parampara in our ashram and we teach yoga uh, for guru health then we run educational institutions academic as well as uh, ancient style of education like ved patshalas and all we we'll also teach sanskrit patshala also we are uh, working towards environment and uh, many of our, many of our um, uh, indians and as well as worldwide people come to goa so we teach them yoga then uh, sanskrit and then also we are blessed with sea shores beaches and also uh, we try to give our own knowledge to all the tourist people over here so goa is a tourist destination and all love to come to goa and we are uh, very lucky that we are blessed to be uh in goa so today uh, same topic i want to express and it is uh, a good topic which will bring joy happiness to all human beings so indian culture is the oldest culture and it can be said that it is the mother of all cultures so i want to uh, brief some of my points in this sessions and thank you very much for joining me john Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Swami. I'm going to take Thank it you. real safe and easy and just say Swami. <laughs> <laughs> no issue, no issue. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome. Welcome. Um the next uh panelist I'd like to welcome to the panel is uh Michael Dury, who's chief content officer of the Digital Economist. Uh Michael is sitting in Düsseldorf in Germany and you have a lot of experience in in India. Could you please share your background, Michael? Yes, thank you so much, and and uh, also a shout out to uh, Frank Jürgen Richter. Many, many thanks. It's a pleasure and a great honor to be included in this in this session, uh, especially because it's a topic that is very, very close to my heart. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the chief content officer with uh, the Digital Economist, um, but my my specialty, or I would say. But my main focal point is purpose-driven change, and this only works when it is closely tied with culture. I'm originally Canadian, and as you mentioned, I'm based in Germany. So, of course, I've I have experience with different cultures, and I've worked in India for many months in in Delhi, and been uh, on various appointments. Have been in Mumbai. So um of course my contact with India is is very limited it is such a diverse country but um I would say that um, the knowledge I've gathered and experiences I've gathered over the years working with organizations trying to implement change has given me uh some understanding of culture and and that's that's what I'd like to talk about culture and change and uh and india's future and so i'm really excited to be part of this this panel of, of fascinating people and uh, look forward to hearing all of your thoughts thanks thanks a lot mike welcome it's always great to have different perspectives um we exactly have, we have the western perspective the european perspective the indian perspective um so looking forward to learning from you today mike and last and certainly not least uh we want to welcome sanjeev kumar who's a, a a highly successful entrepreneur uh from india uh living in london now he's the chief executive officer of a large conglomerate which is called d and o group uh sanjeev welcome it's good to see you again could you uh please share your background and a couple of perspectives thanks john and thanks everybody uh so you know i mean i'll i'll just say because you know you made an interesting observation john about you know sharing the perspective from a western side and from the indian side so the thing is i left india when i was 16 going on 
and I'm 44. So I would say I'm a product of somebody who grew, who was born in India, but raised by the raised in the West. So I have an interesting perspective. So I take the liberty and I sometimes criticize India because I need to do that. Uh, and uh, and I also understand what value I have brought in without realizing that, OK, these are the values that I can bring in because this became part of my DNA without me realizing, OK, this is a big deal for me. It's not a big deal because I grew up in that system. So I think that is an interesting perspective. And that's why I can see why some of these Indian CEOs have done very well. <clears throat> they they go on to run a Microsoft, they go on to run a Google because they have that perspective and we just kind of uh, slip through in a nicer way uh, because we can adjust much easier, adapt much easier. And that's very important thing. I mean, I just didn't realize that before. So for, for me, my background is, as I was saying, so uh, I'm, I'm a product of, uh, you know, trial and error, um, in a lot of trial and a lot of error, it just <laughs> completely <laughs> like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and sometimes you just tell yourself, wow, really, you can make that type of silly mistakes. And I've done that. And uh, we all go through that. So what I realize is, look, uh, uh, I'm on a journey, I would say, you know, on a journey. Uh, I think my biggest realization so far uh, has been that uh, the best thing that I've been waiting for me to happen has already happened with my birth. That was the best thing to happen to me. Yeah. And I think my biggest investment, wherever I invest, will always be me. I mean, if I don't know how to invest in myself, I'll never be a good investor. Uh, and, and and that has been, I think, my learning. And I, I think, you know, in terms of the most valuable thing I have, I think it's people. If you find the right people, if you invest yourself widely in people, and if you grow that relationship... Things happen. Magic happen. At the end of the day, it's all about people. If you don't have people, nothing works. No GDP, no economy, you know, uh, nothing. Nothing has value if you take out people. Uh, and, you know, some might say, uh, you know, it's learning from uh, from uh, my heritage or whatever it is. Maybe it is true. But what I learned is the trial and error happened in the West. So I tried a lot. I failed a lot. I met the right people. You meet after meeting the wrong people, and then you find yourself at a place where you think, okay, this works out now. Uh, so that's been my background. I don't know if it makes sense. I mean, I do have fancy degrees, et cetera. I mean, I went to some of the best business schools, et cetera, but then I realized I paid them so much money, and I should get my money back because they don't train you how to run a business. You know, they, I mean, look, we were told crisis happens only in emerging market. And in 2008, 2009, we had a big crisis. And I, I sent the letter literally to my dean. And I said, can I have at least 50% of my money back? Because whatever <laughs> you guys taught me is not relevant anymore. So that is my background. I mean, uh, take risk, find right people, do right things. Uh, and, you know, always be willing to uh, make mistakes and be kind to yourself. That's what I would say to people. You sound, you sound, thanks a lot, Sanjeev. You sound a lot like an interview that I saw recently with uh, Warren Buffett and his top <laughs> four, his, his top four, uh, among his top four um, 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 uh, uh, sayings, uh, mantras in his life is pick the right people, avoid the wrong people, and learn how to say no. 99 out of 100 times. And so <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. The right things on the on the right thing. Another interesting thing you said just now was about people. It's the most important ingredient that we have. It's among us. We're all fish in the sea, and we got to swim with the right fish. And I've recently been uh, active in helping to promote uh, education for in business for women. And I've got my head pushed into women's education and women's empowerment and, and women's influence and I started to think about this after I had my first bath in this exercise. And I said, you know what? Maybe if the world was run by women over the last thousand years, instead of having a lot of wars, we'd have a lot of collaboration. <laughs> instead, of, instead of having a lot, a lot of bashing and, and, uh, and competition and standing off, we would have nurturing. We would have, com we would have caring. We might not have all the problems we have today if we had women running the world. So that's a segue for me to come over to India and Indian culture and your comments and all of our comments about the contribution that Indian culture, which has evolved over thousands of years, 
can play in the world and the problems that we're having today. And it's about understanding, it's about caring, it's about culture, it's about uh, coll collaboration. And I think that, you know, from my perspective, having been in India only about 25 times, and my first experience there was, wow, wow, this is something different. I, 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 I've got to come back, I've got to learn from this, from, from this experience. So um, I asked a friend of mine, you mentioned Google, I asked a friend of mine who's a senior guy at Google what his contributions and thoughts about our topic today would be. His name is Jitesh Shetty, and he, he's in California, and he said, a global focus on mindfulness, uh, meditation, and mental well-being are, the, are rooted in Indian culture and tradition. Pluralism and multiculturalism have been central to India forever, and now the rest of the world is waking up to it. So I, 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 I offer those comments from him just to kind of kick off. And I'd like to ask Bhavna, Bhavna, if, Bhavna if you could share your thoughts. You said that you talked about your, your uh, experience in your uh, initiative in, in art and pushing culture, understanding Indian culture and its contribution from the art perspective. Could I turn it over to you to offer your comments? Uh, from the arts perspective, um, okay. am I audible? Because yeah, it's right. showing my network. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, from the arts, arts perspective, I would say, um, I mean, the history of Indian art, it goes back to Indus Valley and I can start tracing it then onwards. You know, we have the example of uh, Harappa, Mohanjadaro. We had art and we have artifacts even today from that period and uh, we have we have monuments from ashoka's time we have sanchi stupa as an example so so what i mean the purpose of art at that point you know in our culture was i would say completely different from what it is today you know that was for the ephemeral for something which is beyond reality you know when we see the ajanta paintings or when we see alora and uh, and we see even at that time how um, India was this, you know, um, although I don't know how, it's not proven how the influences came in, but we see a lot of influences coming in from people who came in from outside. Art at that point was not about individualism because it was patronage mostly, mostly by the kings and, uh, you know, and the, and the um, temples built during that time that we have Elora, we have, uh, uh, I mean, I'm so much, so much more, you know, the Chola temple. So, so art has always been around us, whether it's been individualistic, which came in a little later when the Mughals came in. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I mean, we, we have the, you know, the, I mean, Swamiji can talk more about this, the deity culture, you know, which was more a part of, uh, of uh, our day-to-day -day living, you know, and uh, which is what we saw growing up, uh, even in that time and even in later. And later came in, of course, the other forms of paintings, you know. So, I mean, I would like to, like, you know, there's a quote in the Chitra Sutra of the Vishnu Dharmotar, which says that art is, um, in our culture at least, it's above everything. It's above gold. It's above money. It's, uh, uh, I don't know how much of it is true eventually, but, uh, but we've seen that, that uh, the kind of things that, uh, I mean, uh, we've been innovated for are our all, all eventually the arts that we possessed, right? And so much of it we don't have, which has been uh, plundered over the, uh, uh, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a subject for another day. But uh, having said that, and that is the past, you know, uh, and uh, how India has been able to get in and um, um, uh, all these cultures, the Persian cultures, which came in during the Mughals, as I mentioned, and all of that into the paintings that we have now and, and a new style of uh, art that evolved post that with the Rajasthan, with the Jain, with the Pahari, with all of that, what, which was already existing. And uh, it was amazing how, you know, we have this ability of uh, mixing and taking in from various cultures and then bringing out something completely new and uh, which is uh, which was i think the beginning of modern indian art for us i'm just going to quote something from an art critic called rita kapoor which i think is the current situation of contemporary art today uh, uh, so she says that 
she's defined Indian and other Asian societies as a civil society in huge ferment, a political society whose constituencies are redefining the meaning of democracy and a demographic scale that defies simple theories of hege hegemony. It can be said that this idea of society resonates with the practice of Indian art. Artists can display the values and aspirations of their own societies as well as humanity through their works. While some react with cynicism and even despair, others produce an art of resistance. Over the past decade, artists in India and in the South Asian region have protested against colonialism and neocolonialism, global environment, degradation, cultural loss, illness due to poverty, sexual explo exploitation, social and political injustice, war, violence, racism. In confronting such issues, artists have addressed their art to and involved whole communities in order to help them confront poverty and trauma caused by both natural and man-made disasters and preserve traditions and values. In other words, their art contributes to the survival of culture. The global geopolitical shifts with the turn of the century registered an astonishing and defining change in the balance of power towards Asia, military as well as economic. This dramatic turn of events suspended the domination by the first world, given initially by Europe and then by United States of America. South Asian regions have experienced areas of colonial subjugation resulting in fragmented discourses of history, linguistics, politics, ethnicity, economy, and society. So the art narrative emerging from these regions is now highly driven by this colonial pattern, which I feel the current, you know, the current generation of artists is completely trying to break. So, so I, yeah, does that, does that kind of mm -hmm. uh, no, that's answer? A really yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I'd like to come back. That's uh, that, uh, that's great. I, I, so, from I, I, moving I, from something very ephemeral to you know how art has evolved to, so I feel that the artists in India currently, you know, the contemporary artists reacts to the politics around it way more strongly. We are in a much, much, a very interesting position in terms of global the global art scene and how India is placed, you know, and how it has evolved. Whether you know that's why it's giving a quick example of and. I, I actually wanted to show some images because it's interesting always because art is all about visual. But uh, uh, yeah, so that is where we are. And uh, and I think and our culture has kind of, that has the biggest contribution to how we've seen the sea change, you know, in our uh, art and aesthetics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fantastic. Where we are located, you know, the way yeah. we are located. Next, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bhavna. Um, we should come back to that in in, in our next uh, n next round. Um, moving on, uh, Sudhir, you said you shared some thoughts in our pre warm up session about the need to preserve the past and build on the past. Could you sort of expound on that a little bit? <clears throat> yeah, John, I'd like to say a few words. I, I like to start from the very beginning. You know, India, they say, is a Civilization which is about 5,000 years old. And like Bhavna said and Swamiji said, on the Indus Valley, it's built up this full cultural ethos and cultural heritage. And it grew from there and became such a big, uh, powerful cradle for the world civilization to evolve from. But the point I want to bring out is that while it was civilization so strong, it was also a very wealthy region. It was wealthy, it was also a very strong region. So my, my, my take is that it could not have been strong, could not have been so wealthy if it had not been also modern by side by side. It had Nalanda University, uh, therefore it was a seat of learning of India was a seat of learning of Vedic culture of lots of people. So I want, what I'm going to say is that India's cultural ethos, cultural heritage which, which grew for the over the thousands of years also kept modernity in step with it. And therefore there was no dichotomy between its cultural heritage and its embrace of modernity. Until about 17th century, I would say, or 16th century, India was the richest country of the world, having 25% or 30% of GDP and traveling and doing trading. Then there comes a bit of a gap of 300 years, wherein we seem to lose touch with the scientific temper of the world and we fall a step behind. I will not blame only the colonial powers for it, but something happened in the last 300 years that we were out of sync with the rest of the world in terms of modern growth and it is now only in the last 50 70 years where we have started again to take so and therefore my statement was when Pandit Nehru says that the dams and the factories and the big infrastructures are the temples of modern India 
what you're trying to say is that now the model and the past can coexist, can live together. So I'll give you an example of that. We had a very controversial temple issue known as the Ayodhya Ram Temple, carried on for nearly decades the battle went on, in fact, for hundreds of years, till the Supreme Court decided that the temple could be constructed. It was being constructed in Ayodhya, a very magnificent temple to Lord Ram. Now, that is cultural heritage. But I was also share with you, on the same day, it was announced, people forgot it, that they're also putting a big IIT in, in uh, UP, Institute of Technology, of the uh, and also a two all India medical institutes. So I'm saying that this is how India functions. A temple foundation is not being laid, and two IITs being laid together in the same state together. And both are step in step. There is no conflict with the two of them, and they'll go on together. And that is what I mean to say that if a CEO of what Vinit said, you know, a CEO of a big multinational company uh, of AI or a blockchain based CEO in India, he's got a unicorn with him, but he still uses his challenger when the audience is bought to see the date on which he can take it out and he can break a coconut in front of it and take it to the temple and then get into his car in his new Audi or Ferrari and go to his headquarters and start an AI launched new startup. So there is no dichotomy again, I say, in these two, how they exist together in the human psyche or the Indian psyche. And therefore, I feel strongly going forward, we shall continue to race to become a modern nation, but not going to be at the cost of our cultural heritage. They're going to be in step. In fact, it's going to be a catalyst for us. I think. It's going to help us go forward. It's going to take us forward because we've got that mental strength, like I said, the mental well-being to be able to grasp modernity without losing our moorings. And therefore, we're very strongly poised to become a great nation purely because we have got a balance in our mind about that's my initial take. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhir. That, that's uh, really fascinating. Uh, you, met, you mentioned the, the dams and the and the and the structures as temples uh, uh, for uh, for, for India. India, India. India. Commodity. So maybe that's a good segue over to Swami to be able to take off from that point. Offer your thoughts, if you could, Swami, about what he has said and your your. Um, Mix that in with what you're doing on uh, on um, uh, at the uh, uh, at the foundation. The, the you're not on. Uh, you're not on uh, audio. Sorry. There, there we are. Uh, namaste, everyone. And uh, now, nowadays we can uh, see whole world is suffering from pandemic and uh, we are thinking more and more regarding our health. So hearing uh, Lieutenant General, he nicely addressed um, regards our Vedic culture, uh, both combinedly what and how it will be and develop. So same way I want to express my points that India is really uh, having its own uh, cultural heritage but who made it so strong in what way it is very strong we have to think and that point is we are very strong with regards to our culture so many years we are with our own culture it is only because we have dedicated we have surrendered ourselves about everything to the almighty or god so god centric culture is indian culture and that's why we are always with the god anything we do is with our god only so india is having its own cultural heritage because it has its faith on god so today's nowadays we have experienced many things like western world and western development we are focused on that and all such things are money centric economic growth is very important in their point of view but in india we have to think that i want to focus this point because Nowadays, see, pandemic uh, conditions were there. Everything was uh, feeling like everything is unsafe. But inside, 
men human beings were also feeling that they are unsafe why this condition everybody was having money everybody is with the wealth well everybody is having its own uh, identity still they are worried still they were not happy still they were not uh, safe it is only because we are concentrated our life human beings are concentrated outside world more and inside world is still empty and they are unknown unaware of it and this is the how our own culture tells us always say inside be strong from inside and if you are in strong inside everything in this world is for you you are the owner for, for uh, to experience this world and this is how our cultural heritage is uh, so strong and so wealthy second thing when we concentrate on um, superpower almighty and then we think of money it is by product of our own thinking and that's the mindset we have to create in our own being and this thought is not for india only this thought is not only for any region this thought is not only for some countries but it is a universal thought our rishi munis our sages our ancestor no one thought of only one country or one nation we always uh, we are in our brain that vasudhaiva kutumbakam we have that faith that whole world is one family we never thought of individual we thought we never thought of one person or one hand or one leg we thought of full body full world full earth and that's why we are so rich money is by product but our mindset mind has to be set nowadays with one thought that is everyone has to grow everyone has to be happy everybody has to get his own health and this thought i have to uh, means highlight for it will help whole world and this is what intro i want to i want to give some more uh, points with this regards okay in, in this session we're uh, we're running close up now to about 10 more minutes till the end of our session here so that's a great um segue uh, swami over to allow mike to share his thoughts because in his comments he talked about the need to go deeper and deeper and deeper and understand the culture of the uh, in order to be able to uh, implement change so over to you mike thank you john and I, I, as as i mentioned you, you feel free to cut me off because this is a topic i could talk for another hour about and as i said very close to my heart i think one of the things that I, that we need to be mindful of is that there is no one indian culture india is a very diverse country with very diverse rich and uh, cultures i uh, i think correct me if i'm wrong i think there are 21 languages even on the banknotes so that just gives you an idea i mean for us non indians uh it's when we talk about indian culture it's it's kind of uh you know convenient shorthand so but i think we also need to think about what culture is in the first place and if you get the literature there's a very uh useful a very useful um analogy that one of the main authors von Strompenas of Dutchman uses uh it, he talks about breathing now when you go into a culture the first things you notice are like the way people dress what they eat their artworks the way they greet one another these are just behaviors this is like breathing we all breathe you know beneath that is you will find excuse me beneath that you will find values so we all value good air we go out and say mm a breath of fresh air it's beautiful and we also get very suspicious when the air you know smells funny uh, for good reason right so these are our values but that's still just you know um not the, it's below the tip of the iceberg but it's not the the the, the mass below water if you want to get down to the mass of the iceberg below water which is usually not even really conscious to most people you find the underlying assumptions so the underlying assumption behind the behavior of breathing and the value of good air that would be 
the basic assumption that without air, we die, <laughs> right? So look at someone learning to scuba dive. You, nobody tells you to do without air, but you learn to replace this value of nice fresh air, mm, take a step outside and enjoy the fresh air, you begin to value a well-maintained aqualung, you know, your gear, and a full tank of air. And it's surprising for anyone who's learned to scuba dive, it's amazing that like within one hour, even the most nervous um, novices feel perfectly comfortable breathing underwater, which is completely against human nature. And in most change to complete you know, the, the full circle, to go full circle. In most change processes, we tell people, you're going to be different now, you're going to do without air, and they drown. And this is why change processes fail, because they ignore and disrespect culture. And I just want to conclude with an example of this. Tata Motors introduced just-in-time supply chain and lean manufacturing they brought in Japanese engineers to teach the workers how to do this. And now I think um, it's uh, not a great leap of imagination to say uh, this, this is not an easy change process, right? Fortunately, the change team was smart enough not to tell the workers from tomorrow, you're all going to act like Japanese workers. <laughs> There is something, and I'd like to tie this in with something that uh, Sanjeev said about um, Indian CEOs, you know, out in the world and how well they do. There's something that cuts across cultures in India, and that is what uh, one of the other um, most important scholars on the topic of culture, Gerhard Hofstede, another Dutchman, calls uncertainty avoidance. There's an index how, how strong your avoidance of uncertainty is. And in India, the level of uncertainty acceptance tends to be very strong. Indians across the country tend to be able to improvise and adapt extremely well. So basically, the Tata Motors approach was to say, we're going to do things differently. And the workers said, OK, we'll do things differently. And it was a huge success. So there you go. I think um, I, I hope I hadn't gone on too long. And I, uh, I, I hope that reveals something about the mechanisms of culture and how it goes far beyond, you know, the cl classic stereotypes of culture. If we work with culture as our friend and build on it, we can all do amazing things. And India is an amazing country and it will do amazing things. Um, we all have faith in that. That's great, Mike. I learned a lot from you on that. That's uh, you're a very eloquent speaker. Um, Thank you. And clear. Um, Sanjeev, I'm going to come over to you, and then we're going to wrap up because we have about eight or seven or eight minutes left. Um, you are a an example of what Mike was just talking about: uh, an Indian yeah. entrepreneur and business executive who can go out into the west the Western world and see things from many different perspectives and. Our challenge today with Harassus is to figure out how that cultural baggage or that cultural DNA that you brought with you when you went off into the West um, enabled you to do what you're doing, sitting in London and integrating with the world and seeing things. And how do you how do you uh, sort of characterize that? So you know, uh, I can only share with you my own experience, right? I mean, I just don't know how it happens to people. Uh, you know, so I have realized that whether I like it or not, we are all a cultural, humans are cultural being. We, we, the way we see the world, uh, our view of the world, you know, aspirations, et cetera, the way we look at enterprise, the way we value money, all comes from our cultural kind of setup that is invisible to us, but we learn while we are growing up in a society, right? That's how I see it. Whether you're, let's say, you know, if you're in Scandinavia, you have a different way of thinking. You have a different approach to things. If you're German, you're a different approach to things. For example, in India, being 15, 20, half, an, half, 
half an hour late is not a big deal, but in Germany, it's a serious big deal. Their meeting will get canceled. Uh, but in India, it's okay. It's norm. It's understandable. That's part of the culture. In Italy, 10, 15 minutes late is also part of the culture. Now, what kind of, you know, uh, so the learning that I have is, is kind of straightforward. So, so you have, you're growing up in a system where things are happening. And as to, to, to Mike's point, uh, there is no system. When I was, when I was growing up in India, we had no system. Even to get a passport, you have to bribe people. Honestly, you have to bribe people to get a passport. In 1990, when I had to do that, I had to literally stop, you know, my dad says, stop being a Gandhi. You have to go bribe people or you're not going to go and chase your dream. So I said, you know what? If something has to be paid. Something has to be paid. Uh, no, I felt bad for it, but it is, it was the norm. So the system was not in place. The system didn't work. So to, to my points, you have to, you kind of, your brain is conditioned in a way that you have no choice, but to create your own system. You have to figure out, you have to navigate your own way. And when people like us come to the, let's say, as, as you were saying, John, to, to let's say us, uh, or to the West. Uh, you feel that, oh, gosh, there is a system in place here. Wow, that's fantastic. I, I don't have to create a system. So you, what you do is from your own learning, you can improve you, the system that is already exists. And you stop complaining. You stop complaining about, oh, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, this is not working, I'm not able to figure all of this out. Because, you know, uh, where I was growing up, nothing worked anyway. You just you have to make things work. Either you have to use your contact, you have to go and do what you need to do to make things work for you. Sure. So when things don't work, you just understand, okay, things don't work. Because, I mean, I now take things for granted here because, I I mean, I grew up in the West. So I think, oh, my God, this needs to work. That doesn't work. And then I realized as a kid growing up in India, well, the only thing, as, uh, as Mike was saying, is certain is uncertainty. That is the only certainty in India. That is the only known unknown that there are so many unknowns, so many variables beyond your control. There is nothing you can do. So what's happening right now is an interesting bridge that is getting created, right? So you have you have uh, people who, who immigrated out of India. They went to school in the West. They understand the West. And they understand they, they're carrying the culture of getting things done the way they, you know, getting things done, whatever process. So, you know, uh, again, uh, you have to make your own processes. You have to make your own procedures. You have to come up with your own ideas. So you have to build things from scratch. And, and, and that's where, you know, you have no fear in a way because, you know, you've done that. You know, there is no process where I come from or where I was growing up. So you have to build those processes. And, you know, there is a lot of headwind in all the processes that, when I was growing up in India, and I still am doing business in India, and I can tell you, it's a still a very, very, very hard place to do business. And I, and you know, and the only other thing I will say is I can see both sides now, and I have no bias for any sides because I say, look, I I grew up in the West, and I am very thankful for what I've achieved and what I managed to get in the West. But I'm also equally very, very thankful to have an origin and to have that cultural. Uh, kind of culture embedded in my DNA that helped me kind of navigate things better. So that is my own perspective. That is my own journey. For example, if I'm interacting with Mike, if I'm interacting with John, I can interact pretty easy. I don't have any problem because I understand the West. I grew up in the West. I understand India. So I can go and interact with people in India in a different way. And I think, I think more and more managers, more and more CEOs, you know, for example, I will go to Italy and I can function in Italy very well. I go to Germany, I can function in Germany very well. So adaptation is very important when you're running a business. Uh, if I put in, if I put in uh, any of our German colleagues in India, or let's say my English colleague in India, I will see a lot of complaints because, and people in India will see it as a colonial thing. But I, again, I want to change that perspective. It's not a colonial thing. It's the cultural thing where people are used to, things working in a, in a specific wow. way. And this is where our, I mean, my cousins in India would get it wrong. Oh, look at these colonial thinking. No, not at all. Because people in England or people in Germany or people in the United States or Canada, 
they expect things to work in a certain way because that's the cultural aspect of it. That's the system put in place. So if they're going to India and complaining, nothing. There is no racism in it. There is no superiority in it. It's just that their expectations are different. And, you know, and when you help people understand that perspective, people say, you know what, okay, I understand that. So he's not coming in to tell me, okay, he's this guy, so he needs to tell me. I said, no, not at all. Because Mike mentioned Jaguar. Mike, you know, there are a lot of other examples where there is a conflict because any, any do, M&A you do, it's more like a marriage, right? So let's say it's a German company acquiring an Indian company or an Indian company acquiring an Italian or a German company. You know, the way CEOs, the way the promoters or the entrepreneurs run their business, it's okay. And they're carrying that cultural uh, mindset. And we don't like to admit that we use cultural part of our brain more often than not. When decision making, you know, all of that, we have to, I mean, I have friends in India, they won't sign a contract unless and until a Swamiji uh, says, yes, this is the right time to sign a contract. So for me, for, 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 for my CEO, it will say, well, what the hell? You're just taking, taking a piss. I say, no, 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 it's fantastic. If that's the culture, don't worry. The guy has to go consult the spiritual gurus and find the right time. He's not, he's not mucking you around. He's not uh, messing you around. That is part of the culture. So I yeah. think, you know, that yeah. is the bridge where I feel I fit in. And this is why I feel I need to do the explanation so people understand that there is no conflict. It's just the perspectives are completely different because people are coming from different perspectives. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think I realize we're over time, but I just I, I, I can't help but comment on that, that, you know, I, th I think we typically get too hung up on behaviors on, for example, consulting the Swamiji about a contract. That's, that's a behavior. And in every culture, we have certain customs and behaviors that are different. But the, the bedrock that's built on the assumption about how the world works is we want a good contract. We, we want a contract everybody's going to be happy with and is going to be able to work with for years to come. And so that's where we have to find that common ground and build on it. I think Bahavna, you thanks, Mike. You, my, Bahavna, you have a your mic is off. Mike, you have your microphone is off. Bahavna. Yeah. Yeah. Sanjeev, is it just about culture, or is it also? I mean, things like government policies, bureaucracy, all that doesn't play a role. And I look, I, you know, this is the thing. So this is the thing about India, and I'm doing business in India. Yeah. Culture, you say, so it is, you know, uh, the politicians come from society. Politicians mm -hmm. don't come from, you know, you don't import politicians. So True. all the politicians in India come from the society. All the politicians in England or America come from the society. And we, people can complain about Trump. People can complain about anybody else. But... It's also there, individuals, right? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That it's yeah, no culture, longer like culture, culture, the way I see culture is the glue that is binding the society. What what's the purpose of a nation state, right? It's the nation state is a concept. Why people you know, people are bought into sub, subscribe to the idea of the United States of America because mm -hmm. this is a concept. People bind into that concept and that's the glue. But what happens is over time, as the society gets more complex, people get more complex, their aspirations changes, their view and perspective changes, culture will also evolve, right? So you need to kind of keep renewing it. I mean, the, the answer is not, this is what I would say but to our friend in India. People the answer are is not going back. The answer is not keep mm. going back. The answer is to keep moving forward. So mm. the concept of India that existed 2000 years ago, is probably not going to be relevant 500 years from t tomorrow. So yeah, you take you take what you can, the, all the good parts, and then you move along. That's why uh, I see I I, can, I I just don't blame I just don't blame the politicians because I can't. They come from the society. People vote for them. I don't vote for them. People vote for them. So if you're if you mm -hmm. are going and voting for a specific type of politician, you're going to get specific type of policies. You're going to get a direction that you want to go in. So it's people at the end of the day, the good thing about India, whether people agree, disagree, is still a functional democracy. It works. People really vote 
uh, you know, and people have their own view. I mean, I disagree with my cousins in India about their view of India. But I think what needs to happen is people need to come together and say, okay, what is in India that works for people? As simple as that. And, and, and culture plays a very important role. I mean, you've seen it, um, and, as Mike was saying, a Kerala or a Tamil Nadu or a, or, or, or a Karnataka has a completely a bit of different culture then let's say a Punjab or a Bengal, because there is different India. India has layers of India. That's true. You know, yeah. There's I mean, a huge difference friends, between look, I have, friends, I have yeah. friends, and I shouldn't be saying it, I have friends who told me that they cannot relate to South Indian, they better they relate more to Italians. And I said, wow, what is that? Is that not racism? And they said, no, no, that's not racism. <laughs> but I just don't understand South Indian. So it's a, it's a complex, as, as, as Mike was saying, it's a very complex, very complex society. And, and cultural baggage is all over the place. I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, I've met people from Kerala who just feel, you know, North Indians are not really the right type of people who should be in India. To, uh, to, uh, to John's point, uh, they, you know, they, you know, when I said, look, maybe more women should be running the country, they said, no, no, take the North Indians out. And India will do fantastic. So, so that is the reality. It's very complex. All these yeah, issues. I was told by my Kerala professor in art school that uh, uh, you know you're too well dressed to come to art school, and Punjabi shouldn't be doing art anyways. So, well, <laughs> yeah. his name is Professor oh, Shivji Kumar. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. The one thing I want to say is that our time is up and it's passed, but we're having fun talking about this. So we can talk as long as we want. The the recording is going to be is going to be made. Uh, Frank is going to share this on his website, so we can stay on talking, uh, if even if the lights go out. So, um, but I want to say that you know it's interesting because these issues that you're talking about, Sanjeev, they used to be settled by war. They used to be settled by by power, and yeah. now, uh, especially with the transformation that's going on in the world and digital and uh, technology and uh, the world is flat, which start which was written in Bangalore. Um, is uh, we're, we're having to find other ways to collaborate and communicate and to live together on a small planet without going to war, right? And um, uh, so it, um, all these things are complicated to try to unwind, but why don't we try to focus on back on the beginning questions, which Frank asked us to look at, and then we can sort of, you know, start to, to wind it up, because I'm sure we also have something else you want to do, do today. Um, one of his questions was, uh, where is the future going to take India? And how will we be, we be dragged along with it? So it's like, the, look into the future. Bahavna, could you start with this question? Where is the future going to take India? Let's say in 10 years and 20 years. It's a very broad question. <laughs> I said I have narrowed down my thing to art, this thing, and I think art is in a place where one could never imagine India could be. So at least in terms of I, 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 can, I mean, I relate to what uh, what Sanjeev is saying and what Mike said, and you know about uh, you know what how how the West and you know working with West and India, the problems faced and all of that. But in terms of art, yes, there was difficulty because you know people came with a certain notion of the kind of art that is prevalent here. But when but now as of today. Uh, Indian art is in the Guggenheim, in the Met, in the Venice Biennale, in Documenta. There is no significant exhibition in the world. You know, at 10 years ago, it was just a part of like a, a survey thing where and a little bit of art from India. You know, the Indians have money now. Let's get in their money. Let's get them to fund something. You know, the Tate started like a funding committee to acquire art because they could. They felt that, you know, there are the rich Indians and South Asians who would invest in it which they're still doing actually but uh, but for now you know the kind of artists we have Subodh Gupta and Bharti K living light here in Gurgaon and uh, and we have people like that Anita Singh and and so it's no longer artists they're artists from India and it's no longer the kind of art that we're producing so 10 years down the line I really see it being you know very very strongly placed in the in the uh, 
the world map you know of uh, art and i don't know about companies coming in or setting up and all of that all of you know better <laughs> in that area but for art it's great i think that's great uh, I, just, i just wish there were more museums you know swami ji if you you can you can put in a word to to the government or god that please open some more museums in india we need that <laughs> yeah john you were saying about uh, let me uh, say a few words if i may you mentioned about you know where india is going and the question that you asked just now like i said at the beginning i want to again emphasize that my feeling is <clears throat> that purely from the uh, cultural heritage that we've got the if that be the springboard we may go a bit slowly but i think the modernism or india becoming a model or a more you know uh, enlightened country a little more is quite on the cards because of this bedrock of cultural heritage that we've got <clears throat> which like sanjeev says create in us the resilience to handle the ambiguity and the you know uncertainty which is going to be the part of the next world there's going to be a lot of ambiguity a lot of things to do and we by nature can handle that because we come from a cultural heritage where we give a lot of importance to these kind of things so let me let me give you an example you know today a lot of people compare india and china but china is a great economic superpower but from the moral point of view from the point of view we look at it from the uh, that point of view in leadership in the moral world is lacking while india on the other hand may not be economically so powerful or so strong as the process but it's going to be a uh, so therefore we look at the nation growth in terms of centuries not decades you know we look at millennia so i see that if you look at centuries as part of the growth pattern next 100 years is what we should you look at measuring you know growth i think india may if we continues in this growth come to terms and become what it should be based upon its cultural heritage so therefore where is india going i think india going forward bit slowly bit sluggishly bit very here and there but going it is in the right path that's my thing mm-hmm. yeah i'd just like to uh, comment on that the great statement thank you for that um i i think you know we we have to remember uh, you know regarding this question um uh, about the future the economist john kenneth galbraith once said that the only justification for economic forecasters is to give astrologists some legitimacy uh you know so i mean we all have to be very careful about trying to gaze into a crystal ball at the same time though if you look at what's going on in you know i'm, I'm based in germany a, a a huge export nation when i moved here it was actually the world's number one export nation and there is tremendous focus on india not as a place for cheap manufacturing as a market and as the indian affluence increases it's a virtuous circle you know birth rates will go down overall health will go up education goes up everything improves and this is already this process is already in motion so if the powers that be have the foresight and the common sense to keep supporting that and if the indian government welcomes commerce and exchange with western industrial powers like germany in a way that is not exploitative uh the potential i think is is absolutely tremendous and especially because of the the democratic tradition of uh, of india uh, the empowerment and the entrepreneurialism i uh, i think it's going to be unstoppable that's just my view as i said uh you know no crystal ball but uh i'm optimistic you know the the only thing i will add to what's been said is uh do not underestimate the 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 capacity of indians who have done well to influence whether it's the united states whether it's to influence japan or whether it's to influence germany or uk uh it's nothing nothing to do with indian government policy not at all nothing you know whether uh people have developed liking for india in the united states nothing to do with mr modi or the government not at all but it's all to do with well. people who have managed to adapt who have managed to say no don't create this for me i will figure out i will work with you i will adapt 
I will become part of the society. I will succeed. Now, that is very, very important. When I talk to my German friends, when I talk to my Italian friends, Japanese friends, partners, shareholders, they say, look, the reason why we work with you is because of that adaptability. And that power, that thing that government, as Mike was saying, if the government in India can leverage that, that's fantastic. But what happens is sometimes, and this is where I get criticized for, there is this unbelievable amount of national pride. And I tell my Chinese friend, the reason why I'm scared of Chinese government is because they have this desire to dominate the world. And I, that scares me. Honestly, that scares me. And they say, you're a Western guy. I say, no, no, no. I don't want you to dominate me. Absolutely not. I'm very happy to criticize my prime minister. I'm very happy to criticize the U.S. president. I say, look, this is guy, this guy's an idiot. If I criticize you, I, you know what you're going to do to me, right? So I don't want a China to dominate the world. I openly tell them. So that's something to, to, uh, 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 to the general's point. I mean, I encourage my friends in India, look, don't talk about global dominance and superpower, then you will lose me. I am not that guy who will come and say, oh, India should be a superpower. No, you know, you need to be an evolved society. This is very, very relevant here. Go back to your own culture. You are an open culture. You encourage knowledge. You encourage knowledge seeking. That's why, you know, world has yoga. World has all kinds of, you know, stuff. You know, the, you know, yoga was given or yoga originates from India, but yoga is popular more globally than it's in India. Because that's where the power comes from, not from your military, not from that. It's sharing of your heritage, it's sharing of your knowledge. And that's where, whether you want to call it soft power or whatever power, but I think that's where the focus should be, not on, oh, I want to dominate the world. Nobody wants you to dominate the world. Leave the world alone, focus on your own society, grow the economy and build things. So, you know, that's where the, I think India's modern, modernity uh, if we go back and learn from 5,000 years of history and say, you know, guys, these guys just thought they had an idea. They put it in a book and said, you know, it's an open source platform. I said, look, open source platform is nothing new. Indians have been doing it for thousands of years. They created the yoga and said, no, I don't need to do an IP. I will just outsource it, open source it. Let everybody have that knowledge. And that's why people like... India. That's what people want to talk about India. Not because, well, there is a sense of national pride. None of that will kind of, it, it will be a struggle to push it. You know, it will be a serious struggle to push it. So that's my kind of summing up. I think modernity, I, I think Frank picked a very right because uh, I think maybe culturally he's thinking that way. If we go, if people in India go back to that culture and say, look, let's be open. It's not about who is superior. As Swamiji was saying, you know, that's, that's the most important part. Like, nobody's superior here. The world is our family. This will work. You go anywhere and you say, look, I and you are, we are both equal. You're my family. Let's be a part of the global family. This works. It sells everywhere. So that's, that's, that's what my summation of all of this is. I want to influence, uh, Mike said, about affluent Indians, and I think you were also mentioning. So Anish Kapoor, I uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with his work, uh, never wanted to show or acknowledge his Indian heritage till about, I think, eight or 10 years back. He showed for the first time in India and he gave this big speech about uh, going back to his roots and, you know, uh, of his growing up in Bombay, like he moved at 16 to UK, uh, Sanjeev. And uh, and so somebody in the audience was like, oh, my God, you know. So I said, I said, he's showing here now because he misses his roots. So they were like, no, because Indians have money and they can buy his art now. <laughs> so his gallery has planned to bring his show to India. And he's been showing in India nonstop since the last eight years now. He never bothered to show before that. So it shows obviously and it's been it's been acquired by the rich patrons from Ambani's to the Nadars to, you know, so many more. So yeah, so these are I mean for, for art examples of how everybody wants to now show the only thing I will yeah. say is this is where Sorry. I get a bit uh, you know a, a bit let down. Is uh, if I 
uh, Mike and John went to India because we are foreign citizens. We will get more respect than a local guy who probably has more knowledge than me. That's the reality of it. So, so that's something that India needs to figure out. The society needs yeah. to figure out for itself. Thanks. Well, I yeah. want to say yeah. when I, I, when I, I um, um, for my about I just turned seventy, and I for the first part of my life career, I was looking at the the U.S. I'm living in Europe. And I was looking at these two big giants, India and China. And I had a lot of propositions to go to work here or there, one or the other. And I was always like divided. Which one is the one? And then I spent time in China and I spent time in India. And then I got into business in India. And then I came away and I said, you know what? That's it. India is it. And China is not it for me. And the reason was because, and then I about... Four or five months ago, my wife dragged me down to Geneva to um, a, an exhibition going on at the museum there about <laughs> the Reformation. The Reformation where the people in Europe wanted to not have this control, colonial power of the Catholic Church. And that's what drove in the 1400s and the 1500s the Reformation. And I'm sure you know more about this than I do. And I see what's going on right now, and, I, and it has to do with the power to the people. It has to do with defining the individual as the center of the, of the universe, not the power who's running the country. And so I said to myself, if I do things to try to help India, to try to somehow in my little way promote, uh, uh, learn from and encourage India, I will be there. I will thereby be helping the world because I will be helping to promote a philosophy, a culture, uh, a, uh, a thought process and a belief system that is more compatible with my own and, and which I think will benefit the world more than an autocracy. So a lot of creativity in India, a lot of drive, a lot of jugard, a lot of we will find a way. And, and I thought, that's what we need to drive. With 1.2 or 1.3 billion people, if we can help solve some of those problems, they will help solve the world's problems. Yeah, I, I think that's it, it, an important um, point to to make. That you know, obviously, it, India has problems, and that the traditional Western approach has been, you know, to come in and say we'll will show you how to do it right and to ignore the uh, existing culture. And that obviously doesn't work as we can see from history. No. And, and so, I mean, that's the, the, the main point that I would like to make is respect the culture, take the time, put in the energy to understand what the culture is built on, what those basic assumptions about the way the world work, uh, the way the world works, excuse me, are and how we can build on them, and then we can we can solve these problems. And uh, there is there there's an amazing case of a, a study uh, about hygiene. This happens to be happened to be in Pakistan, but it could be in any country where there's a problem with hygiene. And uh, essentially, people were given enough soap and a checklist about when and how to wash. No big deal. <laughs> and and uh, the, the uh, improvements in health and, you know, death of, of children and, and older people was, it, there were improvements like 30%. Now, if a pharma company came up with a pill that had that much efficacy, you know, it would make billions of dollars. And here we're just talking about perfectly normal soap and uh, simple instructions on hygiene. And even with, uh, you know, water that is not particularly clean. You know, people yeah. are not stupid. Tom, uh, I have to leave at 3.30 for another uh, conference. So okay. Yeah, we can continue. So I'm happy mm. to hear. Mr. John? Yeah, Swami uh, No, I, I, want to, <laughs> I want to finish my <laughs> topic. Uh, I want to tell one thing is we have to go back to the Vedas. India has to think of Veda, knowledge of Veda and uh, concentrate on that knowledge. And second thing, India will be uh, far ahead with his own culture. 
and thoughts only india has to uh, keep in mind that a fish has to swim in uh, water and he should not think to swim in milk and that's what i want to add to this session thank you thank you thank you very much. this has been a fascinating session i'm i'm looking forward to rewatching it because i think frank is uh, recording all these sessions and i hope we get a chance to meet each other in person in india uh sometime in the next uh post pandemic uh period which is which is certainly going to come thanks to everybody for all of your creative thoughtful and uh and genuine uh contribution to the session i think it's probably a good idea that we wrap it up now half an hour late but n- not not half an hour wasted that's fine Thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, you. thank, you. Bye-bye. thank Bye-bye. you for guiding us. Thank you for helping us, John. With thank you so much, John. John. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Nice, John. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. How do I quit this? Okay. Bye. Stop playing that.